Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Lay's Real Talk. Happy Thursday. The weekend is right ahead of us. I hope your week is great so far. Uh, well, first of all, I mentioned I mentioned on Tuesday that my website is um, updated. Some of you went to my website and made donations there. Uh, to me. And I really want to say a big thank you because donation has become an important part of my income uh, because uh, YouTube ads or ads income is, is not enough after you uh, pay, you know, pay uh, my editor and, you know, people who help me. So I really want to say a big thank you to those of you who uh, made, who have been, or who have been making donations to me. All right, so we have a big topic ahead of us. Um, I almost get a headache, you know, thinking thinking about how to present this subject to you uh, tonight. So the topic is um, amid the internal chaos, particularly particularly the ones within the PLA, has Beijing changed its strategy for taking over Taiwan, or is the war is the plan for a war ha, um, being delayed? So what we have seen in the past couple of weeks um, are one: China's defense minister has been missing. The leadership of the P, uh, the PLA's rocket force, strategic support force, and the equipment development de department are being investigated, and some of the leaders are being disciplined. Now, rumors that the head of uh, the Military Discipline and Inspection Commission is also in trouble, and I share with uh, share that information with you in a in a short while. Uh, now, with the status of a number of Central Military Commission uh, in question uh, or uncertain, and so many top generals being removed or sacked. Has Xi Jinping been, uh, or is Xi Jinping being forced to change his strategy for to take over Taiwan? And is the risk of war in the Taiwan Strait as high as before? Um, can people hear me all right? Okay, yeah? Okay. All right. Um, so tonight we'll cover the subject uh, uh, by following three sub three agenda items. First, we'll talk about another member of the Central Military Commission being sacked, and then secondly, we'll talk about Beijing's three recent moves that may indicate a strategy change for Taiwan. Last but not least, we'll talk about is war after a brutal internal political cleansing still possible. So first things first, let me share with you uh, pictures I've gathered. Uh, so this is Li Shangfu. You you already you're familiar with him. Uh, let me skip that. So here we have a, a X post. I have a hard time saying X. I prefer twi uh, Twitter. <laughs> Anyways, so this one of the influential political commentators and writers. And writer Cai Cai Shengkun uh, posted on September 18th, and basically he said, "There's news that something has happened to Zhang Shenming, a member of the Central Military Commission and secretary of the Central Military Discipline Inspection Commission." Now, uh, here's this guy Zhang Shenming. So, the CMC or Central Military Commission consists of seven. People, let me make this bigger for you so that you can see better. So Xi Jinping is the chairman. We have two vice chairmen, uh, Zhang Youxia and Wei uh, He Wei Dong, and four members. Uh, Li Shangfu, the defense minister, actually ranks number four. So he is the highest ranking CMC member after the two vice chairmen. And then uh, Zhang Sheming is the lowest ranking CMC member, and he's in, he's on the far right, and he is in charge of discipline and inspection, discipline inspection. So I circled the three guys that I talked about on Tuesday who were missing from a key uh, PLA 
training session on September the 15th, right? The fact that Li Shangfu, Zhang Youxia, and Liu Zhengli, um, the guy who is the chief of staff of joint staff department, um, all three were missing from that important meeting. So I, you know, the, 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 the green bubble on the left uh, are the three guys that I talked about on Tuesday. Now here's the fourth guy. That's the one on the right, Zhang Shenming. Um, so this is very puzzling. Now, the person who disclosed this information, I want to say, uh, the, this gentleman, Cai, Cai Shengkun, he was the first person who disclosed that Li Shangfu was missing. On, that was on September 8th. No, September 7th. So he was the first person who broke that news, which was later widely reported by mainstream media. And it's sort of confirmed, right? So we know he he was credible on that on that piece of information. So that makes me think that this <laughs> disclosure is more than likely true. Um, because the same person within uh, a little bit, uh, within 10 days or 11 days, you know, made a second disclosure of information related to PLA officers. It makes me believe that it's credible. So that means that the seven, that means this will leave us, you know, excluding Xi Jinping, that will leave us with only two people that seem to be okay, He Weidong and also Miao Hua. Um, he Weidong is said to be put in charge of the military operations against Taiwan, and Miao Hua is um, is in charge of, of our political work. He's the, the political director um, of, of, um, of the PLA. So that's a very <laughs> uh, drastic change, right? Um, now, let me talk about Zhang Shenming's downfall because it's shocking, but it's not surprising. Let me talk about this guy. He has a strong tie to the rocket force. He served as the director of political, uh, uh, he, he, uh, the director or the head of the political department of the Second Artillery Corps and political commissar of the Second Artillery Corps Command College. You know, the Second Artillery Corps is the predecessor of the rocket force. So he has long been involved in PLA political work. After Xi Jinping's restructuring of the PLA during his 2015 military reform, he became the first political commissar of the newly established training and management department of the Central Military Commission. And in July 2016, he became the political commissar of the commission's logistics support department. And then in January 2017, he became the secretary or secretary general of the discipline, discipline inspection commission of the Central Military Com Commission. Um, and also that's the year, 2017 was the year when he joined the Central Military Commission. Um, so he's been there, he's been playing this role since 2017. Now his career path um, spells a lot of problems for me because number one, he's affiliated with the rocket force and we know the rocket force has been, it's been Xi Jinping's heartburn, shall we say, has brought heartburns to Xi Jinping um, for a number of reasons. I've talked about this many times in, in my previous live streams and I won't spend time on that. So his affiliation with Rocket Force, that's number one. Uh, number two, he is he was the head of um, or the political head of the uh, another department, that's the logistics support department. Now, just like the equipment uh, equipment development department, which Li Shangfu was the head of, uh, both Li Shangfu and Zhang Yuxia were uh, were you know were chief of Similarly, the logistics department is also, what, what can we say, is, um, is 
is in a lucrative business because their business involved large military contracts, right? The equipment development department deals with, you know, hardware procurement, you know, the development of uh, weaponry. Um, so this, the, the, these are large, they, they involve large defense contracts, whereas the logistics support department involves food, supplies, right? The uniforms. So all, it's also an area that that's prone to um, corruption because of the money involved, right? Because of the budget. So that's that. And also uh, in his post, in Mr. Chai's post, he did say that because he has been playing the role of the, dis uh, the head of the discipline, di discipline inspection commissioner, and he has been the driving force behind the rocket force investigation, he inevitably has alienated many people within the PLA, some of whom could be his mentors in the past, people who have promoted him. Um, so from his, from what he said, you know, people might got, might got upset and turned against him because, I mean, it's hard to say that he has not been involved in some kind of a corruption cases, right? Being the head of the a logistic support department. That's a breeding ground for cor cor corruption. So all, all of the positions that he has held in the past uh, eight years spell problems, right? One after another. So his, so he, I just gave you the number of reasons for his downfall. Um, and, and another important reason is uh, Xi Jinping could be very upset with him because he has been put in charge of discipline. And guess what? He didn't do his job. Look at the number of people that Xi Jinping is forced to take down. And some of them are the people, the very people he trusted. And so this guy did not do his job. Well, he's been doing this job since 2017, and that's six years so he, he can't really explain to Xi Jinping how he screwed up, how how come he didn't catch all these problems, right? All, all these problem problematic behaviors. So that's another important reason for his downfall. Um, so therefore, there's several signals that his his sacking um, is sending. That's number one, Xi Jinping's investigation started from the rocket force, expanded into strategic support force, and then the equipment development department, and now logistics department. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's a natural footprint, uh, not only logistics department, but also political work, because Xi Jinping could be thinking that, well, the reason these pe we, we have these problems is because people who, are, who I put in charge of you know, political work, um, ideological training, ideological thought education, <laughs> that's a CCP term, you know, the very people that he put in charge of thought education failed in their capacity, and therefore he's having all these problems. So it seems like a natural progression of his um, internal investigation and cleansing. However, if you look at all the departments that he's touching, they are all important functions to support the PLA in time of war, right? The rocket force, strategic support force, equipment development department, and logistics department, and political uh, political department. So, so you could say it's a natural um, trajectory of of his investigation, but it's also um, it's it also aligns with his war preparation. Maybe he has a a strong interest in cleaning up these departments or these organizations within the PLA um, in preparation for, for war. Now, I do want to mention two people because Mr. Mr. Tsai um, said in a later post, I think in, in the, um, if he said that on the 18th, so maybe on the 19th, on the 19th, or maybe even the 20th, today's the 21st, he did say that, um, this guy, Liu Zhengli, who is the chief of staff of the Joint Staff Department, who I mentioned missed a meeting, a key meeting on September the 15th. 
Uh, he said that this person, General Liu, is likely to replace Li Shangfu to be the next defense minister. I also read somewhere else that he is. This guy is not getting along with Xi Jinping very well because they don't share the same vision for war.、Um, not that she he disagrees with Xi Jinping on war. I think their approach.、Um, They may have he may have a different approach to warfare than than his leader, so the two don't see eye to eye on how to approach、um, the battle. So, and that I think explains. Although that 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 piece of information was not revealed by the same writer, but I think that explains why he will be put into the position. He will be removed from the position of、um, chief of staff of Joint Staff Department, but put into the position of defense minister because the defense minister is more of a、uh, deals with external relations for the PLA、uh, rather than.、Um, Being the commander、um, uh, for for the PLA during war, so that's what I heard. And also,、uh, people say that Zhang Youxia.、Uh, it's unlikely that Xi Jinping will remove him, just because the cost、uh, the cost to Xi Jinping's reputation and is too costly if he removes this guy because this has been one of his closest ally allies and. He cannot afford to take this guy down, so it's unlikely that he will be sacked. So that's what people say. I just want to relay that information to you. Okay, so with all that said, that's still quite、um, quite a shock, right, to to China observers like us. So that brings us the ultimate question: Will the top echelon of the PLA in such in such a shaky state? I mean, with, no, with with the top echelon of the PLA in such a shaky state,、um, obviously the morale in in the Chinese military is affected, and soldiers understand that. Yeah, I mean, they, they're not interested in going to a war that they cannot win, or the likelihood of winning is very low, because they don't want to be, you know, cannon fodder. So the question is: Is Xi Jinping still adamant about taking over Taiwan by force, and has he changed his mind and postponed the war? And is there a strategy change? Right, that's the whole point of tonight's discussion. So I want to review three recent developments、um, concerning Xi Jinping, the PLA, and the CCP,、uh, which I think indicate、uh, a strategy change. So the first is、uh, took place on September the fourteenth. I do I have a page? Oh yes, I do.、Um, you you probably are, have, are very familiar with this already, or you've heard about this. This is the newly issued twenty one articles、um, to set up a cross strait. It, it's 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 called cross strait integrated integrated development demo zone in Fujian province. Um, and it's called the opinion on supporting Fujian to explore new paths of of cross strait integration and development, and build a cross strait integration development demonstration area demo area. Like I think by demo they mean、uh, what do you call that pilot pilot yeah pilot project. The Chinese say demo, and here we say pilot project. All right, and the document is quite long, but the full highlights are: I put them here. That they're、um, they want to create a, a, a first choice destination in Fujian for Taiwanese, and they want to create a deeper economic integration between Taiwan and Fujian, and it's. A whole province integration, meaning all of Fujian, and they want to encourage people-to-people -people exchanges, right? And if you if if you read if I read you some of the wording, I mean, it just sounds very、um, propaganda-ish.、Um, let me just read you something、uh, here. It says,、um, it says, 
including, okay, basically includes six major items and 21 articles, including facilitating the life of Taiwanese compatriots in Fujian, abolishing the registration of Taiwan compatriots for temporary residence in Fujian, and encouraging Taiwanese compatriots to apply for China-issued Taiwan resident permit. Um, and it says that Fujian will be the first home for Taiwanese compatriots and enterprises on the main on the mainland, so that Taiwanese people can fully feel the benefits of integration and the affinity between Fujian and Taiwan. When I read that, I'm just like, wow, what what a great piece of propaganda it is. <laughs> so it's lacking. I mean, it, it's it's a propaganda piece, and it's lacking substance. Um. So. So that I think, uh, well, or for example, some of the some of the integration area uh, like Xiamen and Jingmen, right? Xiamen is on the mainland side, and Jingmen is is part of Taiwan, and they're so close to each other. So that can be like combined as a as a integration zone, and so that will effectively. Um, what's that word? I forgot. Um, Sorry, that word just slipped my mind. So that would be effectively, you know, occupying Jinmen, right? Xiamen and Jinmen. And then Fuzhou and Mazu are also very uh, closely. So this could be CCP's um, tactic to take over those two Taiwanese islands. Anyways, so I think Xi Jinping, I think this plan is a propaganda work to work on the Taiwanese psychologically. Um, I think Xi Jinping has not given up his plan to take over Taiwan, but his strategy has changed. He knows the PLA isn't in its best shape <laughs> to go to war. Uh, rather than confronting the United States and its allies um, on the battlefield, I think the CCP wants to rely heavily on cognitive warfare and information warfare to break Taiwan from within. And this has always been CCP's top strategy uh, because it's what, what they do the best, right? What it does the best. But Xi Jinping and his advisors have realized that it's probably their best chance to win if they're serious about war. Um, now, using cognitive warfare to convince Taiwanese, what does that mean? Like, what's this cognitive warfare? It's basically convincing the Taiwanese that the mainland isn't bad and the two sides can integrate into one system. Um, so, and this strategy is a two prong approach. One is to continue to threaten Taiwanese with force to instill a psychological fear so that they want to give up. And, and the other is to show them a way out by saying, we can integrate, you know, come over, you know, come over to Fujian and we'll, we'll, you'll see how well we will mingle, right? Let's build a, uh, let's build a pilot area. So the entire goal is to force the Taiwanese people and its leaders to give up the idea of defending their island. And this is very important because the CCP understands that once Taiwanese give up without a fight, then the United States and its allies cannot do anything at all. Just like if the Ukrainians stop fighting the Russians, it's useless. Uh, no matter how many, um, how much weapons or the United States and its allies supply to Ukraine, it's, it's, it's useless because they, if they don't want to defend, right, it's useless. So therefore, paralyzing Taiwanese determination to defend their island becomes CCP's top and only choice now because it's more cost effective and and uh, gives the regime a higher chance of success. Um, now, Taiwan's Ministry of Defense confirmed that the CCP has adopted four major modes of cognitive warfare against Taiwan. I actually... Um, oh, yeah, here. Sorry, I just want to show you this. This is a report actually from 2020. And recently I read that the, well, first of all, this report was from 2020 and it mentioned this four approach. 
that CCP uses. Um, and so it has an outreach mode, um, and it's controlled by the central government, and it, it's it, it targets the general ta- ta- general sorry general audience, and it, it, the infrastructure is through TV, radio, uh, and then the little pink mode, uh, and it has a content farm mode and then collaboration mode. So it, it kind of explains the the four different types of operation. Um, so. This this is something the CC I, I I brought this up because this is something that the CCP has been actively uh, rolling out because they want to use this to influence the 2024 Taiwanese election, and uh, it's just that they are going to step up its effort in this area. So we will see this even more. Um, so that's the first event I I want to mention. Uh, with what I with that said, now it's not difficult to understand the other two development developments in the last week or two. I think last two weeks. So let me talk about the other two events. The second event um, has to do with the PLA. So here you have a map. The Taiwan uh, military announced that a total of 103 PLA aircraft and nine warships operated in the vicinity of the Taiwan Strait in the 24 hours from September 17th to the morning of September the 18th. And the total number broke the, the record, broke the highest single-day record. So this, this is their map, and um, the different types of PLA air uh, warship aircraft is uh, is barcoded in different colors. So you have um, the the red is the S, um, Su-30 fighter jets. So they're different type of um, fighter jets, you know, J-10, J-11, J-16. Um, so, and then they mapped it out where they have um, appeared. And and also 40 times, of that 40 times, out of the 103, they crossed the medium line or the mid mid line in the Taiwan Strait 40 times. Um, hold on, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. F- no, 40 flights crossed the center line of the Taiwan Strait and entered Taiwan's um, southwest and southeast airspace. Um, this move achieves three goals for the CCP. One, it's to escalate threat to instill fear in Taiwanese with the ultimate goal of breaking their will to defend their island. And two, goal number two is to cover up the myriad of internal chaos to save the face for the Chinese PLA, right? We've just talked about that. It's to save their face. And the third is to increase leverage um, to negotiate with the United States. So that's why this is happening. And the third event is related to Xi Jinping. Um, so here's a news report from CCTV. And it, it reports that on, this news report is from the 19th. And it reports on, it says that on September 12th, Xi Jinping replied to a letter from the chairman of the Sino American Aviation Heritage Foundation. Jeffrey Green, and the Flying Tigers veterans, Henry Moyer and Mel McMullen. Um, In his reply, Xi Jinping said that in retrospect, the people of China and the U.S. forged a deep friendship in the fight against Japan. So let me just read you what he wrote, okay? Well, based on this news report, it says... Recalling the past, the people of China and the United States, uh, people of China and people of the United States made common cause in the fight against the Japanese, withstood the test of blood and fire, and forged a profound friendship. Looking ahead, China and the United States as two great powers 
have an even more important responsibility for world peace, stability, and development, and should and must realize mutual respect, peaceful coexistence, and win-win cooperation. And it goes on to say, the hope of China-U.S. relations lies in the people. The foundation lies in the people, and the future lies in our youth. Um, it goes on and on and on. Now, the Flying Tigers, with the volunteer force, um, made up um, made up of uh, retired American fighter pilots during World War II, who responded to the call of the Republic of China, the Kuomintang government, not the People's Republic of, you know, the government that's in Taiwan. So it was to respond their call to help China fight against uh, the Japanese invasion. Um, and, and this is very interesting that Xi Jinping wrote a letter to respond to that. Um, and this, this now... I think you may say there's nothing. I mean, Xi Jinping probably writes, well, you know, many letters like that. But the fact that CCTV and Xinhua published his letter um, is sending a message, right? It's obviously sending the message that Xi Jinping intends to send in that letter. And it's, to me, that letter strikes a a softer tone than the messages the CCP has been sending uh, when addressing the United States. It's a much softer tone and talks about deeper or profound friendship, mutual respect, blah, blah, blah. So, and I think this is, this tells me that it's consistent with that strategy change. So now that uh, she and his advisors wants to want to downplay the, the, uh, the you know the war or the military operations they want to um, you know appear a little gentle with the with the Biden administration because after all you know um, they want to you know they want to create a situation where they can take Taiwan from within without having a war with the United States so why um, you know, why get the Americans so, um, why put them on the, you know, <clears throat> why upset the Americans, right? All right, so let me summarize it quickly before I go to the last point. So the CCP is using a two-pronged approach to, one, increase its military threat over, over Taiwan with the hope that the Taiwanese would be intimidated, and two, wrote out a friendly welcome to Fujian and welcome home type of program as a solution, as an alternative for the Taiwanese, and starting integrating Taiwan to be part of the mainland is its you know is is its strategy. Um, what it wants to do is create a reality, make Taiwanese realize it's already a reality. It's sort of like the moving strategy, right? It's like you want to moving with someone, so it's difficult for the other party to to deny the relationship you know it's like they just want the they, they want to move in and so it's a reality so then taiwanese cannot say hey i don't want to be part of the mainland um we're already living together so that kind of i think that's that kind of strategy for a for a lack of a better way to explain it so so meanwhile ccp will deploy all of its assets in taiwan trying to influence public opinion to make politicians accept Beijing's um, recommendation or option or suggestions, right? Um, I think the 2024 Taiwanese election will be a very important indicator um, to, to, uh, to show how effective CCP's strategy, um, this strategy will be. So does that mean that we will see no war in the Taiwan Strait? Um, is No, my answer is no. And is war, so then the next question is, is war after a brutal internal PLA cleansing still possible for, for Xi Jinping and the CCP to pull up, to pull? And the answer, or my answer is yes. Um, 
I think the impact of a cognitive warfare will be maximized uh, when CCP use it uh, in combination with some sort of military operations, right? Um, so, and then, but the point that I want to make is, so is that there's, there's a precedence in, in another communist country in which a war was won, was won after a brutal political cleansing and the CCP and Xi Jinping are certainly familiar with that, with that anecdote. So now let's talk about um, Joseph Stalin, who started a war with Finland, right, um, after the infamous The Great Purge. So if you, um, let me just go to, yeah, so, so The Great Purge or The Great Terror, it was um, Joseph Stalin's campaign to solidify political power um, by purging other um, influential political uh, opponents or rivals within the Soviet Communist Party. The the entire campaign lasted started from August 1936 to March 1938, but it went through several phases. So let me just give you some numbers. So from the second phase, I think it's maybe the third. I think it's the third phase towards the end. So from July 1937 to October 1938. So within that. Uh, 15 months, he 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 did a very thorough cleansing of of the Red Army. Let me just give you some statistics. It's shocking. So he removed three. When I say removed, uh, I'm not saying bringing people down from their position and lock them up, throw them in prison. It was execution. Okay. So he removed three of five marshals who were the equivalent of four-star generals, 13 of 15 army commanders who were the equi equivalent of three-star generals were removed, eight of nine admirals, um, uh, who were in Navy, right? The purge fell heavily on the Navy, um, were gone, 50 of 57 Army Corps commanders, 154 out of 186 division commanders, 16 of 16 Army commissars, and 25 of 28 Army Corps commissars were gone, meaning executed. So if you do the math, that means the Red Army lost 80% of its top military leaders within a year during this political cleansing. And then Stalin launched the Winter War, which is the, the war um, with Finland. He invaded Finland a year later. And as the result of losing many commanders, I, I do have a picture. Uh, th these are the Finnish um, military personnel. So as a result of losing so many military commanders, the Soviets were in complete disarray in the beginning stage of the war. And dis despite superior military strength, um, they suffered, the Soviets suffered severe losses um, and it initially made little headway. And in terms of the comparison, I mean, the Finnish uh, military was was nowhere near the the Soviet military. Um, the Soviets have an absolute advantage in terms of troops and equipment. Uh, Finland only had 120,000 soldiers, and I think they had a population of I don't know how many. It was under under a million. Um, I think it was under a million, and they only had 30 tanks. The amount of tanks they had was only one hundredth of the amount the Soviets had. So Finnish fishermen and hunters um, took the gun and joined the battle. And, and because of the because the people who were um, commanding the troops, I mean, because they lost all these commanders, the Soviets had no coordination between units and no synergy between different types of troops.
And the Finnish army quickly recovered from its initial shock. And um, and they knew the terrain well. And in addition to holding, uh, I mean, they basically turned their hunting skills <laughs> to war um, and led the Soviet army into deep snow and narrow areas. Um, and then from the beginning of 1940, the Soviets adjusted and improved the coordination. In the end, the end results, okay. So here, oh, here is a, the, the Finnish the fishermen and, and hunters, you know, they wore these white um, ski, I mean, they use their ski gears, they wear, they wear these white uniforms, so they blend in with the environment. Um, and and got protected that way, whereas the the, the Red Army, you know, didn't have that kind of gears. So so <laughs> I thought that was very interesting. But in the end, the war ended uh, three and a half months later with the Moscow Peace Treaty um, signed on March thirteenth, nineteen forty. In the end, uh, here's here's a map of Finland's territorial concession to the Soviet Union is shown in this red area. Um, Finland lost or, or uh, gave about 9% of its territory, uh, which represents about 13% of its economic resources. Some people say, I see different numbers. Some say uh, gave 11% of its territory and 30% of its economic resources. I don't, I don't know, but I think 9 and 13% sounds more reasonable. So the, this historical anecdote showed us several things. One, CCP's political cleansing in the PLA will destroy morale and affect collaborations and even war um, commandship. However, it can still win over time by its sheer size and volume. So um, for example, I have seen people talking about um, the mainland Chinese giving a proposal, like a proposal has been put forward in China, suggest, suggesting that the PLA should convert thousands of obsolete J-6 and J-7 jets, fighter jets, convert them into suicide drones to attack Taiwan. Uh, they say that these planes are old, but have the advantage of being so fast and ordinary anti-aircraft anti artillery cannot easily intercept them. And even if they lose their target by uh, electromagnetic jamming, they have a larger bomb load than ordinary drones. And any crash landing in a densely populated area can cause a lot of damages. So if one such a drone can consume two of Taiwan's anti-aircraft missiles, it would be considered a big win for the CCP. And if a large number of drones and missiles arrive at the same time, it's still likely to exceed the upper limit of Taiwan's air defense capability. So that's just one idea that, you know, my people were discussing and give an example of um, the how CCP, you know, CCP never plays, I mean, it's, it's not strong um, military hardware and and um, uh, it's it's not it doesn't have good weaponries. Uh, it's it's much inferior to the United States, but it's um, it's it's smart on tactics and strategies. So. Um, so it's not so the the, the pe pe what people are saying is that it's not very technical. Um, they use the analogy is if you pour a bucket of water into a cup, even the bucket spills a lot of water, um, the cup still will overflow easily and quickly. It's a simple matter of volume and size. So on that note, um, I don't think we should assume that we, we shouldn't assume anything at this point and I think the war cannot be easily dismissed um, that's what I want to say <laughs> all right it's not easy to uh, to finish all of this but I did <laughs> all right let's see I hope this is helpful 
it's a lot of a uh, lot of thinking on my part and a lot of a lot of reading a lot of thinking i think i lose some hair over this <laughs> i hope it's helpful okay let me see if people have questions for me all right um <sighs> Let me go through the super chats. Kat, kat, kata, <laughs> katopa, katopa rescue. Thank you. Thank you for the donation. Keep fighting the good fight, Lei. You are doing a great job. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. All right, let's see. Um, let me go through the super chats real fast. If you have questions for me, put my name in front so I know it's addressed to me. Um, uh, I'm scrolling, scrolling really fast to, to see if there are super chat questions. Okay, that seems to be all. Let me see. Um, I'll go through some other questions. Let me go back up a little bit so I could get some questions. All right. Oh, let me see. I'll just pick a question. All right. Um, make sure you put my name in front so I know it's addressed to me. Well, there are a lot of oh, Mitsu. The Taiwanese get open news. They have been they have seen in the last few months what an absolute train wreck the mainland is economically. You would have to be high as a kite to fall for that. Uh, yes, you're right, but you'll be surprised how many Taiwanese. I mean, I have talked to people, um, for, you know, who are highly educated, who were educated in the West, but they they fall for that. They they do think that some sort of integration uh, with the mainland is a good option because they want to avoid war because they have they believe that if they don't accept that if they don't work out some kind of deal with the CCP then there will be the island will be subject to war and then everyone loses that's you know so you're right but don't be surprised of how many people don't think that way in Taiwan i have personally talked to them and find it very surprising yeah, and these are highly intelligent people. And that worries me. Um, oh, here's one. Marco Polo. Does Taiwan have a spy network operating on mainland China? I hope so. Well, it's more difficult for the Taiwanese to operate that in in China, because it's first of all, it's heavily, you know, it's under surveillance, and it's much larger, right? And it's so much easier for the mainland to infiltrate Taiwan because you have like the size, right? You have a small island, you know. If you just send a few dozen people to Taiwan, if the CCP sends a few dozen people to Taiwan, they can, you know, they can be effective. But if you send a few dozen people to the mainland, it's it's a large country. And they could be, you know, scattered. Um, so, and then with the the anti uh, anti spy law that has just enacted in what in July, I think the it it will be more difficult. But who knows? Um, yeah. All right. Let me see. Question. Max Shredder. Hey, you said that communism is a natural for Chinese culture, but so is West democracy. The most natural for China is to establish imperial dynasty. Both PRC and Taiwan aren't natural. Um, but West democracy has proven to be successful in Taiwan. So it's compatible with Chinese culture. Right? So... It, it, if it can work in Taiwan, it can certainly work in China. So I, I think that democracy can work in China because it has it, it's working in Taiwan. Um, 
Is the world ready for a China that go back to an imperial dynasty? Um, that would be interesting. That that would be interesting thought. All right, Brian Smith. Thank you, Lei. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining me, Jeff Ramos. How robust is the industrial complex? How robust is the industrial complex in Taiwan? What do you mean, industrial complex? How robust? Can it withstand the test of war, bombing? Hmm. I I don't know. I think I think with the way some of these missiles are built, I think. If a war starts, I don't know.、Um, I don't know if any structure, any robust structure, can withstand, you know, the test of modern missiles. I just doubt that.、Um, Silas Larson, recently, I've noticed an incredible number of CCP bots on Germany DW YouTube channel. Have you noticed? I.、Um, Yeah, I think there's just so much、um, activities on、um, on on Twitter on X because that's really a very active platform for Chinese, for people who are interested in Chinese politics, China, China news.、Um, that's where they exchange information.、Um, there's just so so many. You're right, bots and、um, uh, what do. Pornographic contents in Chi- in Chinese language, you know, there's like onslaught of porn content on X, you know, targeting these pro de- <laughs> pro democracy, those、um, anti CCP type of discussions, and、um, and people say, you know, why, you know, remember I talked about how Xi Jinping has an account on X and his daughter. You know, one is Xi's moments, and the other is my moment. You know how people find out why people believe those are actually their social media accounts? It's because those two accounts are f- free from the attack of these porn contents. They were they were never attacked, so you know that you know.、Uh, so people believe that you know there's some kind of algorithm controlled by the CCP.、Um, so. It's very sad. I think Elon Musk should do something. It's just very, very annoying. Yeah. Mark Pollard, do you think she would be smart to start starving the U.S. of consumer goods before starting the war? Starving the U.S. of consumer goods before starting the war. Consumer goods. I don't think so because that then then we will both be starving. We will be starving. I think the Chinese will starve even more because then that their their workers will lose job. They 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 will lose a significant amount of their manufacturing jobs. Um, that that's even more dangerous. Suppose the Americans won't have access to these cheap made in China products. How much? Would that affect our lives? Let's say we can't buy Christmas lights anymore, but everyone has so many Christmas lights <laughs> at home, right? And say we can't buy these some cheap utensils here and there. I mean, I don't think it will affect our lives so much. It may affect some people, but overall, it's okay. People can manage, and I think we have too many of everything at home. <laughs>、um, But then it will starve a lot of Chinese if that were to happen. So I don't think he, I don't think he would do that.、Um, um, let me see.、Uh, let me see.、Uh, questions. Jonathan Doe, am I right thinking the Taiwanese are voting for a new prime minister in January? Uh, they're voting for a new president in January, now, not prime minister. The president of China, Alpha Lima, like if CCP crumbles, does government come from Taiwan? If CCP crumbles, does government come from Taiwan? Oh, so you're asking if the CCP crumble crumbles, will the government in Taiwan goes over to the mainland? To rule, to rule over them, to rule over. I mean, Taiwan will achieve unification、um, 
if it goes to the mainland to rule, right? Well, that depends on if the mainland Chinese welcome them, right? After the CCP falls, it depends on what are the options. You know, if the Taiwan, the current or whoever will win the 2024 election or whoever was, whoever will be in power at the time um, in Taiwan, the question is, will the Chinese people give them a chance? If people like them, if the mainland Chinese like them, to say, hey, you've run Taiwan pretty well. Why don't you come over? You know, we'll give you a chance. It's the unification may achieved that way. It certainly can happen. And I and I think it's a very, very benign way to achieve, you know, unification. Um, and And certainly it's better than war of any kind. Tolum Ptolemyo Salamancha, Lei, if the PRC falls like the Soviet Union, what would likely be the move the Taiwanese government? Like I said, I, I think they should talk to the Chinese people on the mainland directly to say, give us a chance. Um, give us a chance. Uh, if, we don't do, if we don't do a good job, you could vote us out of office in four years, but give us a chance. You know, we managed, you know, Taiwan, uh, both parties can go to go to mainland China. The Kuomintang, the DPP, you know, whatever. I mean, Taiwan has a number of political parties. They can all go to China and uh, run for election and see who the Chinese people like. And they may run against with other Chinese politicians or Chinese visionaries who want to uh, run for office. It's all possible. You know, why not? I think that would be a lovely picture to see. Um, Jason Angle, Lei, do you think the most people who live in Taiwan, like me, share my view and will gladly take up an AR-15 and <laughs> stinger system to splatter invading little emperors? My Taiwan friends surely will. Well, I certainly admire your courage and bravery. Um, and I think I do agree that many, many Taiwanese think like you do. But sadly, are all Taiwanese politicians think like you do? I do not believe so. So are all the elites think like you do? Um, because they have more at stake, right? And, and the CCP is very good at influencing them. You know, the CCP is very good at influencing a few people uh, that seem to be in control, and they're they're good at influencing the election. So, um, yeah, so that's what I worry. All right, let me take a question from someone who hasn't who I haven't answered. Sam G. Lay, how many CCP troops would defect if they had the chance? Um, you have to understand, people living in China, they live in fear. Because it's if they defect, uh, they have to be successful, or they will lose their life, and their family may be affected. So it's a it's a life and death situation for them. the 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 stake is very high. Um, so I can't really answer that question. I think it's just um very high stake for them. I saw, a, I have to tell you this, this post that I saw and it's so insightful and it's so funny and it's written in Chinese. It says, um, uh, what does it say? It says all the, okay, all the higher, all the officials worry whether or not if they will have a job the next day and all the middle class people worry if they will still have a house the next day. And the, all the people at the bottom of the social strata worry how they're going to make the living the next day. Everyone worries. And yet they're all waiting for something to happen. They don't know what they're waiting for. They're not even sure if what they're waiting for will happen. But they're all waiting for something to happen. And they all sense that something will happen. I think it's so true. <laughs> It's so well said. I mean, that's exactly what's happening in China. <laughs> um, 
I'm glad that I, I remember that. Yeah. So you asked me how many troops would defect. I think they're everyone is thinking the same thing. Everyone is, but they but they all but the, the certain amount the fear is still tremendous. It's still uh, a totalitarian regime, right? So all right. Um Rob Hulk, like are there any plans to build a a turn a tunnel a tunnel between Taiwan and the mainland. I hope not. Um, I hope not. Why? Why build a tunnel? It would be so costly. I think Taiwan is not interested in building a tunnel with the mainland. Um, um, let me see. Thomas Waldron. How would CCP react if the full Quad Alliance stands together? Having India knock on the back door should remind Xi how Germany fared with a two-front war. Um, I think I think these these alliances certainly uh, these alliances does have an effect on the CCP, but I don't think they can play that big of an effect uh, in time of war because the CCP understands the West, the Western countries have rules to follow and they are de democratically elected government and they don't like to prolong war and they are afraid to lose human life. And the CCP, on the other hand, does not care about human casualty. It does not mind human suffering, and it could do anything as long as it, it wins war. So um, I don't know how effective these alliances, if it makes the West feel good, oh, we have alliances, but like I said, diplomacy does not work for hooligans. <laughs> you know, diplomacies work for gentlemen. So when you when you have a, a whole a whole alliance of a gentlemanly alliance, how effective is that to deal with a, a crazy hooligan who's who's reckless? I don't know how effective that is, right? So I know it makes Western politicians, Western heads of state, feel very good, feel accomplishing that they have built alliance to contain the CCP to. Um, how to say, build a, a small yard, high fences, <laughs> um, to de-risk. I don't know how effective that would be. Just like I said, I mean, the, the CCP came up with the way to turn obsolete J6 and J7 fighter jets into deadly drones that's loaded with bombs, and they're going to drop them over heavily populated urban area in Taiwan. They have thousands of those, and how that's going to overwhelm Taiwan's defense um, defense capacity. So, how I mean, they don't play by any rule. They don't play by convention. So, how are you going to deal with a rogue regime like that? So, I think the Western heads of state need to they need to think uh, cleverly. You know, they need they can't use diplomacy to contain a um a rogue a, a rogue regime that's that's my opinion um let me see from um, um from haroslav hensley um do you believe many ccp members want Democrat democratization instead. China skipped the 1989. That would explain the recent cleansing. Of course, many CCP members want, want to have a real political reform, but they're afraid to say so. I mean, like I said, every Chinese are thinking the same thing in their mind. They all know something is going to change. They're just afraid to say it because if they do, they'll be rep reprimanded. Hector Aylan, thank you for the donation. Uh, wow, I have I have uh, Crunch de Grace Hopper. NHK Today reported that China attributed their claims to Japanese-held islands on mistaken GPS data and have relinquished all previous claims. True, 
true or to what effect Taiwan has yet to back off from same. The China attributed their claims. Of I have not. I have not seen that report yet. But people say, I have read reports that the maps, remember a few weeks ago, China released these controversial maps that caused a lot of um, anger in its neighbors. And I read that it's the result, it was the result of some political struggle, a different political factions fought. It was the result of some internal political struggle. And I thought that was interesting. It, it landed in this crazy map. So it's possible that now one faction um, beat down the other faction, and now they are, um, you know, taking it back. They're backing off from the from the map. Dave M. Republicans are urging Biden to invite Tsai to the Asia Pacific Economic Summit in San Francisco. What could go wrong with that? Thanks for your work. I don't think anything will go wrong. What would Beijing do? Threaten with war? Jump? Say, hey, I'm not going to talk to you. I think we should do that, right? Why not? You know, the, st the strategy of ambiguity is, is obsolete. You can't be ambiguous anymore. You have to take a stand. The, the, the more clear it is, the more effect you will have. Um, if you want to be ambiguous with a with a hooligan, let's say if, if you have a kid that's throwing a temper tantrum, you want to be ang ambiguous with that kid, you're losing. You're losing as a parent. You have to be very clear with that kid throwing a temper tantrum, right? You have to explain the rule, explain the consequences, and be very strict and not budge. Once you become ambiguous, forget it. You can't discipline the kid. The kid will do whatever he wants. So I, I think it's so simple. It's such it's so simple when you say it, but I don't know if they see it. So I hope Tsai is invited to APAC in San Francisco. Why not? Just to test it. See how Xi Jinping would react. Just test the water. You have nothing to lose. <laughs> Anyways, I really love this discussion. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Oh, for Molly. Robin, new to your channel, and I hope you don't stop speaking the truth. I will not. Thank you, Molly, for the for the contribution to my channel. Thank you. All right, I'll take one last question. And I think, wow, I've been talking for one hour and 40 minutes. That's a lot of time. Okay, so Mitsu, uh, last question falls on Mitsu, uh, is from Mitsu. Yuan Dynasty map you mentioned being taught to kids on the mainland means that China will try to invade Korea after Taiwan. Korea is very hard to keep. I don't know what they're thinking with that map. Like I said, it's 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 the result of some political struggle internally, which can cause Xi Jinping dearly. So maybe he's trying to reprimand whoever put that map out and trying to deal with the political, the geopolitical consequences. All right. All right, that's all. Um, thank you very much for joining me. It's great to have you here. Oh, I still have the map on the screen. So let me come back. Thank you very much. And I'll see you hopefully on weekend. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.